Well, as I said, it's absolutely fantastic to be here tonight, and I want us to consider the subject of the reliability of the Gospels. And I want to begin with my friend Bart Ehrman, uh, who I think some of you may have met. Um, he looked at the Gospels, and this is what he said about the Gospels. What do you suppose happened to the stories about Jesus over the years as they were told and retold? Not as disinterested news stories reported by eyewitnesses, but as propaganda meant to convert people to faith, told by people who had themselves heard them fifth or sixth or nineteenth hand. And then he asked the question, did you or your kids ever play the telephone game at a birthday party? In other words, the beginnings of Christianity is like the telephone game. You know how the telephone game works? Everyone passes the message around. But it's a game set up deliberately to corrupt the message so everyone can laugh, isn't it? I mean, think of the rules. You have to whisper it. You have to say it only once, and you're only allowed to hear the message from one person. Why should we think that's a good comparison for the beginnings of Christianity? Why not say beginnings of Christianity is more like karate? Has anyone said to you they're worried that karate is being corrupted because it's being taught from one person to another to another? No, because you know there are checks and balances in that to make sure the lesson's being properly taught. Well, I think that's the same thing about Christianity. But I want to look specifically at this idea that a lot of people have that the stories of Jesus just changed because they were passed from one person to another to another. And so what had been remarkable things got exaggerated all the way into full-blown miracles. Is that a valid way? And I want to say, actually, it's not. But let's begin with where the Gospels are written. According to tradition... The Gospels were generally not thought to have been written in the land that they come from, in Judea, Israel, Palestine, or so on. There is a tradition from the 4th century that says Matthew's Gospel was written in Judea, but otherwise the traditional understanding is that the Gospels were written in other places like Rome or Antioch or Ephesus. Look at a German scholar, Gerd Tyson, who's pretty skeptical about the New Testament. Where does he say they were written? Well, he thinks a bit of John's Gospel might have been written in Palestine, but the rest written elsewhere. Or look at Bart Ehrman himself. What did he say? Where then did these anonymous Greek-speaking authors, that's the authors of the four Gospels, living probably outside Palestine some 35 to 65 years after the events that they narrate, get their information? So, there's a general consensus that most of the four Gospels were written outside the land. Well, that help, helps us focus on the question, where did they get their information and do they know what was going on in the land? Do they have knowledge of the space and time they're talking about? Well, think about the different things that people might know about. You could think about the agriculture of the land. Do they know the right plants, the, uh, the shape of the building, the, the culture? Do they know about the coinage, the economy? Do they know about the geography and so on? And we're going to look at a number of different tests tonight to say, did the people who wrote the Gospels know what they were talking about. Because if it really is telephone game, if it really is written outside the land, how can they get that right? That's our question we're going to look at. So I want to begin with one test, and this is the test of what people were called. Did they give characters in the narrative the right name? Now, do we have anyone here tonight called Jacob? Anyone here out there? Can I see? No, no one called Jacob. Do we have anyone called Michael? Michaels? Mikes. Any Mikes? Yeah. No, no Mikes? Yeah, we've got some Mikes. Yeah, I'd expect there to be Mikes. There should be Mikes in this context because there are enough people. Statistically, it's probable. But over time, what we find is certain names increase in number. So if I was talking to a much, much younger audience, there would probably be more Jacobs. But back in 1967, hardly any Jacobs were born in the US. And that num name just increased about 100-fold over 30 years. So you get a huge increase. Now, people have studied what people were called at the time of the Gospels. A couple of scholars, uh, one uh, Tal Ilan out of Germany and one Richard Borkham uh, out of the UK, have studied and they've looked at what people were called on bone boxes and gravestones and in historical records, people like Josephus, and they found out there's a huge correlation between what you get in the four Gospels and what you get in uh, the sources outside the four Gospels. Let's look at that in a bit more detail. Well, this one might strain your eyes. 
But I just wanted to give it as an illustration of how the New Testament or Josephus or the bone boxes, the ossuaries or the Dead Sea Scrolls have, you can lay out the statistics, the number of names they have. And one of the remarkable things you find is that the most popular name outside the New Testament for a Jewish man was Simon. It's also the most popular name inside the New Testament. The second most popular name outside the New Testament is Joseph. That's the second most popular inside the New Testament. There's an amazing correlation. What you can say is that outside the New Testament, between 15 and 16% of Jewish men were called Simon. Inside the New Testament, it's about 18%. In other words, it's really pretty close. And then when we get a bigger data sample, and we say, let's look at the top nine men's names uh, in, in the land of Israel, we find about 41% of men had that one of those names inside the New Testament. It's 40%. That is amazingly close. Now think about this. This is a correlation between the names we find in the New Testament Gospels and statistics that have only been known about for the last 10 years. That's an amazing thing. Because if the Gospels are written outside the land, how do they know what people are called? You see, could you write a story about people in Libya a hundred years ago put in lots of characters and give people the right names. You might know some Libyan names like Gaddafi or Al-Magrahi or something like that, but would you be able to give names in the right proportion to each other? You might have some vague idea of Arab names, but would that give you the right names for that country rather than another country? I don't think so. I don't think you could even do it for your own town for a hundred years ago. It's just not the sort of thing you can do. So how can someone get this right? But it's not just for the men's names, it also works for the women's names. The top woman's name outside the New Testament was Mary. Top woman's name inside the New Testament is Mary. They didn't have so much imagination as to what to call women. In fact, I think it was something like 29% of women were called Mary and 39 inside the New Testament. Now here, the data samples are smaller and so we get a bit more variation. 50% of women had won the top nine names outside the New Testament, and it's 61% inside the New Testament. But think about it. This is a pattern which is showing up over four different writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, writing five different books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. That's a phenomenal thing, because it shows basically the sort of pattern you get for each of the books individually and for them all together. How did they get that right? We can look at the ranks of different names. Uh, in Israel, we can look at the number of different individuals. But it's not just that there were Jews in Israel, of course, there were many Jews in Egypt. Look at that. You find in Egypt there were Jews, but they had a different pattern of names. So Simon, which was the most popular Jewish name for a man in Israel, is not in the top ranking names when you go to Egypt. And then in second place, we have the name Sabbatius. Now, does anyone here know anyone called Sabbatius? No? Why don't you know anyone called Sabbatius? Because the Gospels were written about Jewish men in Israel, not Jewish men in Egypt. Otherwise, we would know lots of people called Sabbatius. It just means born on the Sabbath day. Great name for a dog, or whatever. But Decithius, Pappus, do you know those names? No, it's a completely different pattern. So what we find is the Gospels have got the right names for the time and place. But there's more than that. You see, what happens if the name Simon is so common? You call out, Simon, and lots of people turn their head. So you've got to do what Wikipedia talks about, disambiguate. You know that bit on Wikipedia says disambiguate. Distinguish one from another, and this is what they do. So Jesus has two disciples called Simon. One is Simon, surnamed Peter or Cephas. One is Simon, surnamed the Zealot or the Canaanite. Jesus goes to have a meal with someone called Simon the leper, but he isn't a leper at the time because people are sitting around having a meal with him. Maybe Jesus healed him. Simon Peter in the book of Acts goes to stay with Simon the tanner or the leather worker. Simon of Cyrene. You add something extra to those names and you do that with the most common names and not with the less common names. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph. It can be the the husband's name, the father's name, the job, the town you come from. It doesn't matter, but you've got to do something to distinguish one from another. 
And so what we find is the Gospels have this pattern for all the most common names and not for the less common names. Now that, to me, is an amazing thing. If people were making up stories away from the land, just inventing stories, they wouldn't get that right. You see, our intuitions about what people would be called if you were making up a story wouldn't be reliable. Now you might say, well, that just shows that each of the four gospel writers did careful research and they asked people what they were called. Well, that's possible, but the cleverer you make them in their research, the harder it is to say they got the story wrong through incompetence, okay? And the other thing we can say is, you might say, well, that just means that they came from the land. Well, no, because your intuitions, even writing about your own time and place, probably wouldn't give the names in the right proportion. You see, have you ever had the experience of giving a child a name that you thought was really unusual and distinctive, and then, as soon as you give them the child a name, you find there are tons of other children with the same name? You know, I talk to crowds, and they say, yeah, I've had that experience all the time, because your intuitions as to what the most common names are aren't always reliable, because they're based on samples of maybe a few hundred names that you, you come across a lot. But what you find is, here, we've got exactly the right proportion. Now, I want a bit of honesty tonight. Does anyone here struggle to remember names? Yeah, we've got, we've got some raised hands there. Um, I mean, let's face it, we all struggle to remember names, don't we? Just all of the time, we forget names. I've forgotten names just today. Uh, anyone else forgotten a name today? Yeah, okay. So, I'm in good company. So, it's one of those things we do. Why do we struggle to remember names? Because there's no logical connection between someone's name and the person. Sometimes there are plenty of logical reasons why they shouldn't have that name, in fact. Yeah? So, have you ever had that situation? Maybe you've been tonight. There's someone here tonight, and you are supposed to know their name, and you've forgotten it. But you could say all sorts of things about them. You could say what part of town they come from, what car they drive, how many people there are in the family, what their job is, how long they've been you know, around. You, you can say all sorts of things about them. Just that one piece of information you can't remember, the vital piece you need in the social setting, the, the, the name. Or you watch a film. You remember what the minor characters do, don't you? You remember what the major characters do, but you forget the names of the minor characters. You remember the story, but not the names. You might even forget the names of the major characters as well, but you still remember the story. Someone comes back from holiday, they tell you about people they met, and they tell you the story about the people they met. They don't sort of put in the names, uh, because they know you're going to forget. They might put in the names, but then you forget. So think about this. If the Gospels have correctly got the detail, which is the hardest thing to remember. Right. Isn't there every reason to think they can get the other things right? The story bit is the easy bit compared with the names. And what's more, we can say that when stories are passed from mouth to mouth, in a very short time, the names are going to be forgotten. We've even got a phrase in English, haven't we? So-and-so said. Now, we say so-and-so when we say it's not even worth saying the name because you're going to forget it, so we're just going to say so-and-so, yeah? So... That's what happens with stories. The names drop out. It's not that they get added in as people embellish it. So if the gospel writers, as Bart Ehrman said, got their information fifth or sixth or 19th hand, there's no way you would get the names correct. I think the names would get scrambled about second hand. So in other words, what we've got is consistently in the gospels, high quality eyewitness testimony. And that, I think, is what is shown to us by the data. But we can also look at other so-called Gospels. You might have heard about the Gospel of Thomas. Run the name test on that and you'll find it's not very impressive in terms of giving you authentic names from the time. Uh, one of the titles uh, in one of the manuscripts tells you that it's written by Didymus Judas Thomas, which means twin Judas twin, which just really wasn't much of a name uh, for that time or place. The Gospel of Mary, the most common woman's name, and we don't even know which Mary we're talking about. Um, it doesn't talk about Jesus, it just talks about the Saviour all the time. Or, what recently came out, the Gospel of Judas. Well, it has two figures with the right names for the time and place, and that is Judas and Jesus. And then it has a whole load of folk from outer space. You know, uh, that is not impressive knowledge of space and time. So far from these Gospels being evidence against the four Gospels, they're evidence for the four Gospels because they show us what happens when people do make up stories. 
Now, we can apply the name test to Matthew's gospel and find some remarkable things. You see, just take the list of the um, 12 disciples given you in Matthew chapter 10. And I'm putting in brackets next to each of the names, if it is in the top 99 names, okay, 99 names for Jewish men in Israel. And what you find is, whenever it's one of the more popular names, it gets a qualifier, a disambiguator. When it's one of the less popular names, it doesn't. So, this is how it's written. Simon, rank number one, therefore qualifier, called Peter, and Andrew, rarer name, but given with relation to his brother, his brother. And James, rank number 11, the common name, the son of Zebedee. And John, rank number five, his brother. Philip, low ranking, 61st equal, no qualifier. And Bartholomew, 50th equal, no qualifier. Thomas, not even in the top 99, no qualifier. And Matthew, high ranking, number nine, the tax collector. James, high ranking, 11, the son of Alphaeus. And Thaddeus, 39th equal, low ranking, no qualifier. Simon, top ranking, the Cananean. And Judas, high ranking, Iscariot. Now, I know there are other things going on with that list. But the amazing thing is that that list correlates with statistics that have only been compiled in the last 10 years that simply weren't available to anyone back then. That tells me this list was formulated in that land where you needed the disambiguators. It's not that it was made up by anyone later. We could also say it affects speech. You see, a name like John is quite a common name, rank number five. So you can't just talk about John, you need to talk about John the Baptist to make sure you're talking about the right person. So when Herod hears about uh, Jesus uh, doing things, he says to his, uh, uh, to his um, servants, it said, he says, this is John the Baptist. He needs to say that. He can't just say this is John because they say, which John? We've got lots of Johns in the palace. Uh, that doesn't make much sense to us. But what you find is, though the character in the narrative says that, the narrator simply says John because it's quite clear from the story which John we're talking about. So in verses next door to each other, the character says John the Baptist, but the narrator simply says John. And then when Herodias' daughter wants his head, she can't just say, give me the head of John. She might have got the head of the wrong John. So she says, give me the head of John the Baptist. And then the next verse said, he sent and beheaded John. So the narrator speaks one way, the characters speak another way. Now, that's the sort of way people would have had to have spoken back then. Now, you could say that doesn't mean I'm really getting what they said. It could be just a clever narrator who knows how to tell a, an authentic-sounding story. But remember, the cleverer you make the narrator, the harder it is to say he got it wrong through incompetence. And a lot of the time, people want to play two contradictory cards against Christianity. One is there was lots of clever, clever conspiracy, and the other thing is there were lots of very stupid bungling and missing, messing up the message. You know, we've got to say, these two methods are basically in tension with each other. Why not have that middle road of the early Christians neither being particularly stupid nor particularly clever, just being ordinary, regular people who are reporting what happened to them? But it's not just that we can do it with the name John, we can do it with the name Jesus. Look at the number of words there are in, per gospel. Uh, Luke the longest, Mark the shortest. Um, then we look at the number of occurrences of the name Jesus. We find Jesus is most in John's gospel, fewest times in Mark. But Mark's the shortest, so do it as a proportion of length, and you find Luke has the fewest. He tends to say he, whereas John tends to say uh, Jesus a lot. All I'm doing to show there, all I'm wanting to show is that the four Gospels use the name Jesus in different ways. So there hasn't been some conspiracy to make sure they all mention him in the same way. But then we're going to find a common feature in all four Gospels. And that is that the narrator, when he talks about Jesus in a crowd setting, in, where, where, sorry, when someone, not the narrator, in speech talks about Jesus in a crowd setting, they want to qualify it because, in fact, Jesus was a common name. The sixth most common name. There are other Jesuses in the New Testament. Bar Jesus. Jesus called justice, and so on. So whereas the narrator said they did, just as Jesus had told them in Matthew 21, next thing, the crowd say, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. They disambiguate. But then the narrator continues, Jesus went into the temple. Or in chapter 26, Jesus said to him, 
But the next time you mention Jesus, it's the servant girl saying to Peter, you were with Jesus. But she can't just say Jesus because there were lots of Jesus. She says, you were Jesus, the Galilean. A slightly more clued up servant girl comes along and says, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. But then immediately, Peter remembered the saying simply of Jesus. Narrator speaks one way, characters speak another way. You see, so when Pilate talks to the crowd in Matthew's Gospel, whom do you want me to release? He says, do you want to release Jesus, who is called the Christ, or Barabbas? He does it again. What shall I do with Jesus called Christ? Over the cross, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Even the angel doesn't want people to get confused. He says to the women, you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. That distinguishes him from other ones. But I can do the same pattern with Mark. There we got, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth, son of David, Jesus. Not every Jesus got their title, um, was descended from David. You with the Nazarene, Jesus. You seek Jesus of Nazareth. I can do it with Luke, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, son of the most high God. Jesus, teacher, have mercy on us. Jesus of Nazarene. But then we have on the cross, the thief on the cross turns to Jesus and he doesn't say Jesus of Nazareth, why not? Because it's not a crowd situation and because people on crosses don't waste words. <laughs> so what we find is the pattern is there throughout. When Jesus meets the couple on the road to Emmaus and uh, they're talking about what's happened and he says, well, what things have happened? He said, well, haven't you heard the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth? They put that disambiguator on. And it's the same we can find in John. Uh, so we, we could have, we found Jesus, the son of Joseph, from Nazareth. This is Jesus, the son of Joseph. But then there's, in John chapter 9, a man who was born blind. And he simply, when he's asked, who healed you? He says, Jesus healed me, nothing more. But the narrative is showing the man's ignorance at the time. He's been physically healed, but not yet given sight of who Jesus is. It, Jesus is. And so illustrating that he doesn't know much about Jesus where he is what his father's name was or anything like that he doesn't know what town he comes from you know just a man called Jesus healed me that's all he can say and so we've got um, Jesus of Nazareth there in uh, chapter 18 twice when crowds come to arrest Jesus whom are you looking for Jesus of Nazareth they say not just we're looking for Jesus do you see Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. All four Gospels, when it's crowd speech, have a qualifier with Jesus. Now, as far as I know, that's something that's only just been observed in the last year, you know, when I spotted it. But it fits together with the other things, that in fact this was a common name, and so people would have had to have spoken that way. But... Once Christianity has spread for a hundred years, it's pretty obvious when you say Jesus, which Jesus you're talking about. So anyone writing the story later wouldn't have needed that disambiguator. They only knew that because they're reporting really early on. Do you get it? That's the sort of thing we've got in the Gospels. So the pattern we have for the four Gospels is the names are just right for the time and place. That's not the sort of thing a forger could make up. One more test. Well, a few more tests, but we're going to do them more quickly. Test of geography. Do they know the towns and places? Well, Jerusalem is the most commonly mentioned place in the Gospels, followed by Nazareth. But they don't just know the town Jesus came from and the capital city. They also know villages, some places mentioned fewer times in the Gospels. Uh, places like Sychar, places like Bethphage. I mean, how would anyone in Turkey or Greece or Italy making up a story have heard of Bethphage, that little village near Jerusalem. I mean, probably some people living up in Galilee hadn't even heard of Bethphage. I mean, how do you know that sort of thing? That just shows knowledge of time and place. But there's some amazing things we can say. Compare the four Gospels, which mention 12 to 14 towns each, with some of the other alleged Gospels, things like the Gospel of Philip, that's where people try to get the story of Jesus having a fling with Mary Magdalene. It's a late document, but that's where they try to get it from. What geography does it know? It's heard of two towns, Jerusalem and Nazareth, but it thinks Nazareth is Jesus' middle name. That's not very good. So in other words, it only got one correctly placed town, and that's Jerusalem, and that's the capital city that everyone's heard of wherever they are. See? So that's not very impressive. What about a couple more Gospels? 
Well, Gospel of Peter, Gospel of the Saviour, one town each. And what town is it? Jerusalem. <laughs> and all of the other early Gospels, well, I, I got the 16 earliest other Gospels, 2nd and 3rd century. How many correctly placed towns? All of the rest, zero. Just what a contrast with the Gospels. In other words, if you're an ordinary Bible reader, you've got the evidence there in your hands that these people knew what they were talking about. They knew the time and place. Look at the number of words per Gospel. I've given you on the four left-hand columns, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. On the five right-hand columns, five other Gospels, quite a bit shorter. Look at the shape of those four left-hand columns. I'm going to change from the number of words per Gospel to the number of place names. This isn't just town names, this is places like Rivers and Golgotha, places uh, like that. What do you notice? Well, you notice the big drop-off, don't you? <laughs> Those other five Gospels don't have many place names as a proportion uh, in, in the Gospels. And the other amazing thing is that those four right, left-hand columns just stay the same shape. So if I do number of place names as a proportion of length, what do I discover? To my amazement, they all just come out at the same level. When my research assistant showed me this a couple of years ago, I was amazed. I knew that she would find some distance between, difference between the four Gospels and the other Gospels, and I suspected they wouldn't have so many place names. But the amazing evenness of the place names. How can I explain that? Well, I've got an explanation. Luke says to Mark, hey, Mark, how many words have you got in your Gospel? Mark went through counting the words. Of course, the words weren't separated in Greek manuscripts at that time. That made it a bit harder, you know, and it was a bit before the invention of computers, so uh, that made it harder still. But he went through and he counted. And then Luke said to Mark, Mark, how many place names do you have in your gospel? And again, he went through and counted. Then Luke did a calculation, and he decided he would match the same proportion of place names. And then... Matthew and John heard about this. They thought it was a great idea. And so they matched their Gospels as well. Is that really plausible? If people were putting in place names just to make the story sound authentic, do you think they would all put in the same proportion of place names? It's not really feasible, is it? I mean, even calculating the relative length of two documents is almost impossible when you've got no word division, when column lengths are irregular uh, in width, I mean, how do you go about comparing that? Making that calculation just phenomenally difficult. But if people simply reported the same sort of story, they're reporting things as they happen, naturally putting in place names. Yeah, would that get the same proportion? I think that's far more likely. I'm going to skip over some things. Another test. Anyone know the story of Zacchaeus here? What sort of tree did he climb up? Sycamore tree. Very good. Now, next question. What town was he in when he climbed up the sycamore tree? Anyone? Jericho. Jericho. Thank you very much, Pastor. Okay. Good that the pastor knows. So what's the question we're going to ask? Are there sycamore trees in Jericho? And the answer is, you bet. Look at this. There are two guys up in that sycamore tree there. Now, how did Luke know that? Well, two major possibilities. How Luke could know there are sycamore trees in Jericho. One is he's been there, the other is he's talked to someone who has been there. Another possibility could be aliens from outer space informed him, but I don't think that's very likely. So let's just say this is an evidence that he knows what he's talking about. Could people in another country have simply made up that story? Well, the amazing thing is that a lot of the other countries, Turkey, Greece, Italy, didn't even have sycamores. These aren't like the North American sycamores, you know, they just didn't have them. So you wouldn't even have heard of them to make up the story like that. I want to bring the test together in ju just one passage, and then I'll conclude. The feeding of the 5,000 is mentioned in all four Gospels. It's uh, one of those miracles, few things that's actually mentioned in all four. Well, is it true? Let's start with the numbers. Are the numbers just guesstimates? Are they exaggerations? Well, one of the things we find is that the Gospels count the people very carefully because it says in Mark that they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties or uh, in, in uh, Luke it tells them to uh, sit the people in groups of fifties. In other words you've got probably a hundred groups here or less than a hundred groups, twelve disciples to count them. Some of them are fishermen, they know how to count up to eight fish at least uh, and so you know can they estimate the number of people accurately? Well it actually tells you in the narrative how they did it the people were in groups 
But then we look at the other details. Mark tells you there was green grass. John tells you there was much grass. Well, is that just a detail put in to make the story look authentic, or is it true? But Mark tells you many people were coming and going, but he doesn't explain why. But John tells you it was Passover time. And at Passover time, of course, people went on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. That would explain the detail in Mark. So the two details are subtly corroborating each other, but in such a subtle way that they can't be there just to make you believe it. It's too subtle. You probably wouldn't even notice the proof. But then, in John's Gospel, Jesus turns to Philip and asks him where to buy bread from. Why does he turn to Philip? But then, two verses later, Philip replies, and three verses later, Andrew replies about where to buy bread from. Why like that? That's in John's Gospel. Well, in Luke's Gospel, it tells you that the feeding took place near Bethsaida. And in John's Gospel, it tells you that Philip and Andrew were from Bethsaida. So think about that. Jesus turned to a man with local knowledge and asked him where to buy bread from, and a man with local knowledge in John's Gospel, and another man got together involved in the reply. If I read through John's Gospel, I see no significance to why he talked to Philip and Andrew. If I plug in the information from Luke, suddenly it makes sense. That's the subtle way the narratives agree. Even the detail that they were barley loaves fits exactly with the fact that you've just had the barley harvest because it's Passover time. But what about the grass? Would it really have been green? Well, go to a precipitation chart of a nearby town. And we know when Passover would have had to have been in any of those years. And we can say, wow, we would have just had six of the greatest months of precipitation leading up to that time. Would the grass have been green? You bet. So what we're finding is all of these things come together and tell you this is a real narrative. This is not some just exaggerated story. Now, some people have this idea that gradually over time that miracles were exaggerated. The problem with this is when exaggeration happens, it's because people aren't paying attention to detail. And it's not really feasible that people could be exaggerating all of the bits about the miracle and yet paying very careful attention and detail to things like place names, where it happened, the, the exact people involved, and the sort of things they said. That doesn't work. If you're, you lack attention to detail, it covers everything, do you see? So in other words, everything comes together. We can't prove the New Testament to be historical uh, in the sense that we can't prove everything to be true. Uh, if someone wants to doubt, there's always room for doubt. You can always walk away, although I hope that you won't. I beg you not to. If you are um, on the edge, may you realize this is the truth. This is what you should come to. Don't turn away from it. But there's always room to turn away. But if the Gospels are the result of conspiracy, this is not the sort of pattern we would get. The pages of the Gospels are just full of evidence of their truth. If you haven't read the Gospels or haven't read them recently, I just urge you, read them again and see how much testimony there is that it's true. Thanks so much for listening. God bless you.